Hello, my name is Brian Grubbs. I'm the manager of local history and genealogy at the Springfield Green County Library District. Thank you for joining us today for Jeff Patrick's The Mighty Men of War, the Carthage Light Guard in World War I. Jeff is the curator at Wilson's Creek National Battlefield in Republic, Missouri. He has a master's of art degree in history from Purdue University. He is the author or editor of numerous books and articles on US military history, including Guarding the Border, The Memoirs of Ward Schrantz, U.S. Army, 1912 to 1917, and the second volume in the Schrantz trilogy, A Machine Gunner in France. Thank you for joining us, Jeff. In early October 1918, the men of Company A, 128th Machine Gun Battalion, 35th Division, led by Captain Ward Schrantz, marched away from France's Argonne Forest. They had just endured some of the most intense combat of the First World War and were now headed for a rest area. The division looked more like a band of refugees than a military organization, an eyewitness recalled. The men were unshaven, dirty, and haggard. Their clothing was soiled and torn, their shoes muddy and worn out. Many had grown hoarse from cold or gas, and nearly everyone's eyes were red from gas and loss of sleep. A seri serious dysenteric condition had broken out. Nevertheless, it was a sorry band for, as for looks, but it had played a great part in a great battle. Soon these men from the farms and small towns of Southwest Missouri had an opportunity to reflect on what they had experienced. The battlefield was a sight no artist can paint nor anyone describe, Jack Williams wrote. It was a dogfight from the start for every inch had to be fought for. We had two of the Bosch crack divisions against us in ideal defenses, and they sure hated to give them up. The ground, of course, was strewn with the debris of battle. Dead, dead animals, all kinds of equipment, shattered wagons and big guns, houses crumbled to dust, trees torn down, roads shell-holed, and all the ground churned with shells. I wish I could explain to you how it was, but I cannot, reported Estel Zeiler. The ger dead Germans were so thick that we actually ran over some of them with our machines. If it had lasted much longer, I do not believe I could have stood it, wrote Otto Grigg. We were in six days and nights without sleep or shelter. Anytime you go on the line and get back alive, you are lucky. You cannot imagine what it is to be under shell and machine gun fire. You think every one is going to get you. Sergeant John Cronk explained that an artilleryman within 10 feet of me was struck with a piece of shrapnel that went through his helmet and tore half his head off. Just one of many awful sights. I have wanted war experience, explained another one of Schrantz's men. I got it in this show and plenty of it and have emerged a considerably older and somewhat sadder man. The long road to the Argonne began in April 1917 when the US Congress declared war in answer to Imperial Germany's decision to resume unrestricted submarine warfare against neutral America. Company A of the 2nd Missouri Infantry, the Carthage Light Guard of old militia days, headquartered in Carthage, had just returned a few weeks before from guarding the U.S.-Mexico border against incursions by Mexican bandits. Now the Carthage men were ordered to recruit their company to full strength in anticipation of a mobilization order that August. Company A's newly elected captain, Ward Lauren Schrantz, was a veteran soldier. The 26-year-old officer had joined the Missouri National Guard in 1909 and the U.S. Regular Army in 1912. Discharged two years later, he rejoined the guard and served as a non-commissioned officer on the Mexican border. Now he was tasked with finding recruits to bring his unit up to 150 men or war strength. Despite popular enthusiasm for the war, Schrantz's task was not easy. He had hoped to keep as many veterans of the Mexican border in the ranks as he could, but the War Department ordered that all enlisted married men or other men with dependents be discharged from the National Guard. For several years, the public had been reading of the terrific loss of life on European battlefields, and family pressure was put on many of the men to claim dependency, even though such claim was not justified and the men desired to go, Schrantz wrote. I recall one instance of a rather bellicose lady, an old friend of my family and whose son was a member of my company, who came to my home one morning while I was eating breakfast, refused my mother's invitation to enter, and asked to speak to me on the front porch. She was a very good woman, but on this occasion had worked herself into quite a temper. I'll tell you this, Ward Trance, she shrilled for all the neighborhood to hear as I stepped out on the porch. 
you are not going to take my boy to war, but I did. There was another case in which the soldier was much embarrassed by his family's insistence. A grandfather living down in Oklahoma was not content. He wrote a letter to President Woodrow Wilson saying that he had always voted the Democratic ticket and that I refused to discharge the boy, although his parents were dependent on him. This last statement was not true. The letter went to one of the secretaries of the White House, was sent over to the War Department, thence to the Adjutant General of Missouri, and finally down to me through channels. I endorsed it back with the explanation that the man did not want a discharge and was not entitled to one under the regulations, the interest of the relatives being concerned for his personal safety and not need for his financial assistance. And in due time, it came back disapproved. There was one youth who enlisted at 18, but his father confided to me that he was only 16. However, both parents felt that he should serve as he had developed a roving tendency which had led him on two occasions to leave home without notice. A grandmother, however, had quite different ideas about his entry into the armed forces. He is just a boob, she said, a great big overgrown boob. He'll be the first one killed. The boobs are always the first ones killed. Happily for the youth and possibly for me, this lady did not write to the president. The high physical standards adopted during peacetime worked against Schrantz's recruiting efforts as well. In addition, because the National Guard would not be mobilized until August, the impatient and unemployed enlisted in the regular army and were accepted immediately. Despite these obstacles on Sunday morning, August 5th, Schrantz was able to report his company's strength at three officers and 150 enlisted men. Five days later, a capacity crowd, one of the largest ever seen in Carthage, gathered in the high school auditorium to bid farewell to the company. The assembled citizens listened to Methodist Reverend Dr. W.G. Clinton urge the men of Company A to, quote, conduct themselves as to come back clean and bring the flag back clean. Alan McReynolds, a former captain of the Carthage Light Guard, reminded its members that they belong to an organization with proud associations and that they should maintain the unit's good name. Captain Trance replied that he hoped to show by their acts that, quote, we appreciate our home community and appreciate their esteem and would strive to do honor to Carthage and expected to accomplish a good deal in this war. After a brief stay at Camp Clark outside Nevada, Missouri, Company A was moved by train to Camp Donovan, the training camp for the newly formed 35th Division just outside Lawton, Oklahoma. The sprawling 2000 acre camp contained nearly 27,000 troops by December, 1917. Training began immediately, close order drill, semaphore signaling, scouting and patrolling, hikes and physical exercise helped fill the time. Daily addresses by officers were also prescribed by higher headquarters. These useful lectures included personal hygiene and care of the feet, military courtesy, and one on why we are at war. The latter talk did not impress everyone in the company according to Schrantz. Quote, as if it made any difference to us why we were at war, grunted the old timers with a fine contempt for the high motive propaganda of the government. We are American soldiers and the nation is in a position where it has to fight. That is all that concerns us. The process of becoming professional soldiers was not easy, even for veterans like Captain Schrantz. On one occasion, Schrantz ran afoul of Major General William Wright. One day Schrantz was observing his company at drill when, as luck would have it, Quote, some airplanes rose from a nearby field and began doing stunt flying. I had been speaking to my first sergeant about something and together we stood staring at the planes. Suddenly the sergeant broke off the conversation in an awed voice. Captain, he said, here comes the general. The general was indeed coming, striding across the field with fire in his eye. I advanced to meet him and saluted. Who was that private with whom you were talking, he demanded furiously. That was not a private, sir, I answered. It was my first sergeant. Were you talking about the drill, he further queried. Not just then, sir, I admitted. We were speaking about the airplanes. Whereupon he read me a doubtless well-deserved lecture on keeping my mind on the job. This is wartime, Captain, he said, not playtime. Yes, sir, I replied, and saluted as he turned away, apparently in some surprise that I, I did not attempt to argue with him. I was amused rather than humiliated by this encounter. 
Plainly, the general thought he had caught some National Guard captain hobnobbing with some crony of his hometown in the ranks. He was a bit taken aback when he found it was my first sergeant, and he was obviously surprised that I knew how to take a reprimand in the approved military manner. In September 1917, Company A was redesignated as a machine gun company, but simply changing some documents did not make the company a machine gun unit. Machine guns and manuals were in short supply. Schrantz himself purchased every work on machine gunnery available and learned what I could. After a lapse of some months, I found in a Lawton bookstore a brand new book on machine guns and their use. I bore it back to my tent in triumph, but the officer who had written it knew even less of machine gunnery than I had already learned. After this, I quit the books in despair and tried to turn to common sense instead of instruction. Not only did the company ma need machine guns, it needed mules and carts to haul the guns and ammunition. These too were in short supply. In time, we got mules, just mules and nothing else, Schrantz wrote, and led them daily by their halters through the drill with imaginary carts, much to their bewilderment. Then in time, we received old French carts and harness. French carts and Missouri mules made an inharmonious combination at first. A mule would dubiously eye the cart chosen for him and flatly refuse to get between the shafts. It took much coaxing, cursing, and expostulation before he could be hooked up and started off. Then in a panic at the strange vehicle he was drawing, he would dash off at a wild run to the dire peril of all bystanders. And with the driver and squad hanging onto the reins and all projecting parts of the cart, trying to stay its progress. Eventually a few machine guns arrived allowing the company to familiarize themselves with actual weapons. But Camp Donovan was not all drudgery. The men were allowed to go to nearby Lawton where they enjoyed the sight of colorfully dressed American Indians. Even those who did not venture into town could enjoy some relaxation in camp. Patriotic women in Carthage shipped hundreds of magazines each week to the men. The townspeople also collected cigarettes and smoking tobacco for the boys and provided Christmas boxes and even an Edison phonograph. Despite the best efforts of civilians to make their men comfortable, Donovan was not the most hospitable climate for training soldiers. As Schrantz wrote, Camp Donovan and dust became more or less synonymous. Dust was carried by the wind in great gusts into the tents, often making it difficult to see more than a few feet. By November, cold temperatures added to the misery. Schrantz vividly described, quote, a cold gale which set the sea of tents dancing madly and tugging at their ten thousands of tent ropes. The horses and mules on their still unsheltered picket lines turned backs on the bitter wind and waited with bowed heads for the weatherman to relent. And the cooks muttered imprecations in their dust-filled kitchens as Oklahoma sand and soil billowed through every crevice and into the pans of food. The men grumbled the most about the cold dust and wind as they bore their heaped mess tins to the dirt-covered tables gritted food and sand together between chattering teeth, and then hurried back from their cheerless mess halls to the shelter of their tents again. When the call came for lights out, 27,000 men sought between blankets, a warmth unavailable elsewhere, and a dawn rose again to the noise of struggling tentage and whistling wind with an unpleasant feeling that war was an unpleasant pastime and that in due time, the Germans must be punished plenty for dragging men out into a land of sand and cold. Even with the miserable weather conditions in Southwest Oklahoma, the time passed quickly at Donovan and the Carthage soldiers were no doubt cheered when the oft repeated rumors of movement orders were finally confirmed. An advanced detachment of officers and men from all organizations of the 35th Division was ordered to move overseas to attend service schools in France. The remainder of the division would follow. On March 20th, 1918, the advanced detachment of the 128th Machine Gun Battalion, including Captain Trantz, left Donovan to begin the journey overseas. The rest of his company said goodbye to the camp on April 17th and embarked on the big adventure. Trantz and the advance party sailed from New York on March 30th and landed at Brest, France on April 13th. The rest of his company sailed on April 25th, landed in Liverpool on May 7th, and were soon ferried across the English Channel to France. The trip across the Atlantic was no picnic for the enlisted men of the company. Quote, the compartment in which Company A was quartered was about 40 feet long and ran the full width of the ship. 
There was a main aisle down the middle and on each side were rows of mess tables. Above the tables were hooks from which the hammocks were to be suspended. And each night we would sleep suspended above the tables where we ate during the day. One of the company's members recalled their sleeping arrangements. If you want to know how we slept coming over, just take a bed sheet and tie it at both ends and stretch it on the ceiling. Then have someone swing it as hard as they can as you are trying to get in. Just after you have managed to go to sleep, get up and feed the fishes for a while and keep that process up all night. The bill of fare on the ship did not improve their disposition. Quote, there was boiled mutton, boiled rabbit, boiled potatoes, and boiled rice, with the boiled Australian rabbit not always free from fur, recurring with distressing frequency, Schrantz noted. What was served as coffee did not taste like the beverage so familiar to Americans, and even the tea served on the ship could hardly be termed a palatable drink. There were no bathing facilities on the ship, but the officers decided that the men needed daily baths. Unfortunately, the men were, quote, led in shivering naked groups into a compartment where ice-cold seawater was doused on them from a hose. The pandemonium caused by this treatment led the bathing program to be abandoned after Company A had undergone the ordeal just once. Once in France, Captain Schrantz sent off to attend a machine gun school where he learned that his company was going to train with the British Army. The school boasted a British lecturer named Captain Sharp. The school closed with a demonstration of all infantry weapons, selected students or instructors performing in turn for their group. Captain Sharp elected to be one of the two gunners to demonstrate the Vickers machine gun, choosing as his assistant, a Lieutenant Moore of Missouri. Captain Sharp with national pride announced, you will now see gentlemen what an English machine gunner can do with his own weapon. The two guns began firing. Lieutenant Moore of Missouri gave a beautiful exhibition his chattering weapon running without interruption. The unfortunate Captain Sharp had stoppage after stoppage, correcting each one promptly only to run into another and accompanying his embarrassed efforts with explanatory oaths that quote this damned American ammunition. Trance rejoined his company in late May and although the Missourians were indeed briefly attached to the British Army, in early June orders came assigning them to the French 7th Army instead. After an unpleasant journey by train, the company arrived in the village of Saint Laurent. There they learned the intricacies of the newly issued French Hotchkiss machine gun. Such familiarization was vitally important for their survival. Not only did a machine gunner need to know how to operate the weapon, he had to thoroughly understand its mechanism. Each man needed to know how to take apart and reassemble the gun when blindfolded. In addition, because of losses in combat, Schrantz explained, quote, every man must be a gunner. So the guns were zealously broken down and reassembled until each man became proficient. In addition to new machine guns, newly issued mules and carts were taken away and trucks were issued instead. Company A was to be motorized, although there were only enough trucks to carry the machine guns and ammunition. The men would walk. Their time at Saint Laurent allowed the Missourians to experience their new French hosts. I was billeted in the home of a woman named Madame Flo, Schrantz recalled, who prepared the meals for our officer's mess, which was served in her dining room. She served with great amusement the canned corn, which was a part of our commissary supplies. Corn, she said, was for horses. She had never heard of human beings eating it before. She placed delicious roast beef before us, flavored with wine. She chided us for eating so much. French officers ate little and drank much at their meals, she explained. As for us, we ate much and drank nothing. The stay in Saint Laurent was only temporary, however. Soon the company moved with the rest of the 35th Division to the village of Ventron on the French-German border. There they trained close enough to hear the war, but not participate in it. There was a little spy scare at Ventron. Mysterious flashing lights and smoke columns prompted Schrantz and another officer to investigate. The, quote, the smoke signals came from fires lit in the evening when mosquitoes began to annoy the cattle and were supposed to afford some protection. Late at night, there was an intermittent flash, flashing light far up the east side of a hill. Sliding down the steep hill through the pine trees with pistols in one hand and flashlights in the other, Trance and his comrades surprised two startled French civilians, an inebriated mountain man and his wife, the latter with a flashlight in her hand, obviously trying to get her drunken mate back to their hut 
located near the summit. Finally, on July 31st, Schrantz was ordered to take his company into the trenches. They occupied a three quarter mile section of the front line. On August 5th, 1918, the first anniversary of their entry into service, the Carthage machine gunners fired their first shots of the war and the first ever fired in anger by the old Carthage light guard against German work parties and several nearby villages occupied by the enemy. The men were changed nightly on the harassing gun so as to give everyone a little experience at shooting at the enemy. One man, Private Lawrence Aiken, took his turn on a machine gun, but he became tired when he was required to dis dismantle the gun after each firing. Why not leave it up here, he suggested to the sergeant in charge. We must put it up to shoot again in a half hour. Why not just let it sit? Take it down, replied the sergeant. No sooner had the men done so than a German shell exploded where the gun had been sitting just a moment before. As the screaming of the fragments died away and the clods of earth pattered down, the men heard the sergeant's voice again. You see what I mean? On another occasion, Captain Schrantz decided to try his hand at sniping. Schrantz and one of his sergeants took a carbine and took aim on a German in the enemy trenches. You watch him with the binoculars while I see if I can make him duck, Schrantz said. Schrantz sighted the weapon hopefully and pulled the trigger. He heard the bullet, he's ducked, said the sergeant. Let's move down the trench and, and see what happens. Schrantz wisely told the grinning sergeant. Almost immediately after they moved, there came the crack of a bullet from the German lines, followed by several others, as the German sniper tried unsuccessfully to find Schrantz and his sergeant. On August 14th, the Missourians left the trenches and moved to the village of Gerardmer. Although Schrantz and his company had gained valuable experience on the front line, the brief time in the trenches had not been what many of the men had expected. Comparing his stay at the front to his time on the Mexican border, Sergeant Charles Edwards complained that, quote, if all the fronts are as tame as that one, war, uh, this is not much harder war than the bloody Mexican campaign. The only enemies they had encountered were rats the size of terriers, cooties, and fleas. Edwards and his comrades would soon realize with tragic results that some areas of the Western Front were far more lethal with more talented opponents than rodents and insects. Only a few weeks later, the 128th would see combat in the largest American operation of the war, the Mose-Argonne. The Mose-Argonne offensive, so named because the American Ar Army advanced through the area between the Aisne and Mose rivers, including the Argonne Forest, was the bloodiest battle in American history to that time, with more than 120,000 Amer American casualties. The Allied goal was the critical German Sedan rail line. If the Americans could advance 53 kilometers and capture Sedan, they would cut that vital lifeline, end the flow of supplies to the German army, and greatly hamper the enemy's ability to escape. In order to capture Sedan, however, General Pershing's doughboys would first need to overcome the front line and three German defensive lines. American success depended on surprising the German forces in the region, overwhelming them with superior numbers, and moving quickly toward their objectives before enemy reinforcements could arrive. The Germans were well prepared to meet the American offensive. They had carefully constructed a formidable array of defenses, bolstered by natural features, Quote, the country is very rugged, being traversed by many streams, gullies, and arroyos, forming a series of ridges and spurs admirably adapted to strong defenses, one officer recalled. Within this area, he continued, every foot of ground had been prepared. Everything the German ingenuity, skill, material, and the experience of four years of war could provide had been injected into the defenses of this position. High ground to the west dominated much of the defile through which the 35th Division would attack, a perfect platform to place artillery pieces to shower the attackers with shrapnel and high explosives. In addition, thick barbed wire, machine gun emplacements, and concrete dugouts littered the area. The Bosch have an immense number of machine guns, wrote a soldier, with which they are experts. Their craftiness in keeping hidden was almost uncanny and most of the time we were going against an unseen enemy. Although they were destined to face some of the toughest German opposition in the region, the men of the 35th were among the least prepared. In addition, just days before the assault was scheduled to begin, a number of the division's officers were sacked and replaced. 
Other shortcomings plagued the division as well. The Doughboys were extremely fatigued, having been almost constantly on the move since early September. Their training had emphasized trench warfare rather than open warfare, and communications equipment, including telephone wire, wireless, flares, and aerial signaling panels were either faulty or missing. The Mose Argonne offensive was preceded by a massive artillery bombardment. More than 2,700 guns roared to life at 2.30 a.m. on September 26, 1918. It seemed, wrote one eyewitness, that for a while the lid of hell had been pushed back. The noise was so intense, recalled a Kansas soldier, that you couldn't hardly hear yourself think. As 5.25 a.m. approached, every officer and every section leader in Trance's Company A was studying his watch in hand or on wrist. Every gunner's finger was on the trigger. At 5.30, the Missourians and Kansans stepped off toward the German lines through a heavy fog, soon made more dense by the smoke from the multitude of explosions. As the troops advanced, the 96 Hotchkiss machine guns of the 128th Battalion opened up with a deafening rattle. Barrels became too hot to touch. The heaps of spent cartridges grew. When a corporal thought one gunner was tired, he had another take his place. The total ammunition expended by Company A alone in this barrage could not have been far short of 140,000 rounds. After laying down this covering fire and refilling their ammunition strips, Trance and his men moved forward as well. Despite increasing German opposition, by the end of the first day, the 35th Division had advanced three miles and captured several towns. The second day of the offensive, September 27th, proved far less successful as the 35th Division continued to push north and west, but was quickly pinned down by German artillery and machine gun fire. The damp gloom, the excitement of the fighting the day before, the lack of food and sleep, all contributed against the soldier, wrote one eyewitness. The German artillery bit into our ranks at every pace. Fresh gaps opened as the rut, rut, rut of machine guns increased in volume. Late that afternoon, General John Pershing, not satisfied with the division being stopped by, quote, machine gun nests here and there, ordered the 35th to continue the, the attack. At 5.30 p.m., finally aided by sufficient artillery and tank support, the Kansas and Missouri soldiers plunged ahead. Although the, the division's members could now boast that they had advanced nearly five miles in two days, their units were becoming disorganized and mixed. The future success of the division hinged on adequate artillery support, preparation time, organization, and communication. All would be in short supply as the offensive ground on. Although the men of Company A had been extremely lucky on the first day of the offensive, their luck ran out on September 27th. Trance recalled, as I reported to the battalion commander, a gale of machine gun bullets were pinging viciously into the barbed wire and ricocheting off with a singing noise. Corporal Lewis Hooten had set his squad to digging foxholes for shelter and having seen them fairly safe, lay down himself. A burst of machine gun fire sent three bullets into his back, striking so close together as to go into what seemed to be one hole. Two of the bullets did not strike a bone and emerged almost as close together as they entered. The third struck a rib, was deflected, and made a separate exit some distance from the other two. Sergeant Ellis bound up two of the wounds with a first aid packet, but in the excitement did not see the place where the separate bullet had emerged. He then ordered Hooten to the rear, but Hooten objected, wanting to stay there on the hill and direct his squad and an order from Cap Captain Schrantz was needed to start him back with the other walking wounded dribbling down the hill. At the busy dressing station in the rear, someone glanced at the dressings and asked if Hooten could walk. Then the answer being yes, told him to keep on walking. Finally, he reached a dressing station and there fainted from loss of blood while waiting his turn for treatment, later being loaded into an ambulance and sent to a hospital. Not only did casualties begin to sap the company's strength, but so did physical exhaustion, as Schrantz explained. Quote, since the night of September 23rd, that there had been no opportunity to sleep, save for occasional cat naps for a few minutes on the battlefield. And the officers had hardly even had a chance for that. Besides this, the physical strain of lugging heavy equipment had been wearying on the men, and the nervous strain was no less fatiguing. Already the two days emergency rations had been made to stretch for three days. 
and there had been no warm food since the evening meal on September 24th. At the end of the day, Schrantz's men halted and dug in in the ruined village of Boni and waited for the inevitable German artillery bombardment. Schrantz wrote, Lieutenant Dunn and I took up our abode in a deep shell hole. We lay in the bottom of it, shivering with cold and trying to get a little much needed sleep when a heavy enemy shell struck near our hole and half covered us with a shower of dirt clods. I dropped off for an hour or so of troubled slumber. As the third day of the American drive began, maintaining the pace of the advance continued to be a pressing concern. Consequently, new assaults were ordered for the morning of September 28th. Despite being battered by a torrential downpour of enemy machine gun and artillery fire, the Americans were able to advance into Montrebeau Wood. There they found the Germans fighting like the early day American Indian, behind trees and in ravines. Clusters of German pillboxes were taken only after doughboys crawled toward them to use grenades and rifles. With Montrebeau Wood more or less secure, the Americans dug in for the night. It probably came as no surprise to every man in the division when orders were issued late that night to resume the attack the following morning. By the end of the third day, the battered 35th men faced practically insurmountable problems. Communications was poor at best as runners continued to roam the battlefield in search of command posts and officers. Artillery support critical to eliminating German machine guns and the movement of reinforcements had been inadequate since the opening barrage on the first day and the constant series of hurriedly planned attacks had left no time to reorganize the division. In addition, many officers had been killed, wounded, or missing. Fresh German troops had arrived on the scene and German aircraft had effectively directed artillery fire on American positions, while the exhausted doughboys suffered through deteriorating weather, including cold and rain. Despite the difficulties, the men were required to push on regardless of losses. The Missourians and Kansans rapidly approached the breaking point. Trance recounted his day this way. Quote, my little company followed behind the infantry into Montrebeau Woods. Enemy artillery seemed to be laying direct on their targets and their accuracy was uncanny. I saw one entire squad of nine men off to our right, blown down by the blast of one shell. How many of them were killed and how many wounded, I have no idea. But the entire group, which was in single file, went down like a bunch of nine pins. The effect of this direct fire from the enemy guns was very demoralizing. As we approached the southern edge of the woods, the ground was littered with German dead, many of them machine gunners who lay sprawled across the weapons which they had served to the last. Other Germans with their hands in the air were passing through our lines to the rear, and I noticed several of them smiling nervously. It impressed me that these smiles did not indicate joy at being captured, but rather relief at the fact that they had not been killed by our infantry who had just passed them up. As the company emerged into, into a little open spot, there came the crack of bullets and the pop pop of an enemy machine gun. A number struck the ground in front of me. A man was shot through the shoulder a few yards behind and another, another, another almost at the tail of the column received three bullets through his leg. From several other points in the woods, Maxims were firing and since machine guns not carefully sighted beforehand were absolutely useless in this jungle, I decided to take my company back toward the edge of the woods to wait until the infantry had done a little mopping up. For an hour or more, we rested here, many of the men dropping off to sleep through weariness. I became conscious that I was both hungry and thirsty. We had had little food since the attack started and my water was exhausted. My hunger and thirst overcame whatever qualms I might have had and I took a dead German machine gunner's canteen and food. The canteen was entirely full of what seemed to be weak coffee with a dash of whiskey in it and it helped me much during the next 24 hours. The bread I took from the haversack appeared to be some sort of brand combination and tasted somewhat like molasses. My men also discovered about this time that there was food in the German haversacks, and it was not long until all had been plundered. The haversacks of the American dead were also searched, but in most cases were already empty. Casualties continued to mount in Trance's company. When Sergeant Charles Edwards placed his men in a shallow trench for shelter, then lay down and went to sleep, some tanks approached the edge of, of the woods drawing heavy enemy fire to the vicinity. One shell struck among the men, killing Sergeant Edwards and severely wounding two others. 
The 24-year-old Edwards had been a member of Company A since 1914 and had served on the Mexican border. Had he lived and the war continued, he would have been made an officer. A general order issued after the battle praised him. Quote, Edwards commanded his section with extraordinary courage and during this time set a magnificent example to his section, exposing himself repeatedly to fire until killed in action. South of the woods, the company's vehicles and kitchen could not keep up with Schrantz's men, but the kitchen camp was not immune from enemy fire either. As soup was being prepared, a shell exploded nearby, showering the kitchen and men with dirt and hurling dirt clods into the soup. Cooks, kitchen police, and drivers hurried for a nearby dugout, but soon they emerged, tasted the soup, found it good despite the dirt, and ate it. As soon as darkness fell, they started forward with cans of the soup, hoping to find their company. That night in Montrebeau Woods was one of the most miserable that I ever spent in my life, Schrantz recalled. Rain was falling, the none too waterproof raincoats were sodden, and everyone was wet and shivering in the chill. The carpet of leaves which covered the ground was soaked with water, and even the men whose duties at the guns did not require them to remain awake were hardly in a position to get much sleep. Despite issuing yet another attack order, 35th Division Commander General Peter Traub recognized that his men were near the point of physical and mental exhaustion by September 29th, the fourth day of the battle. Early that morning, he noted the division had lost its punch because of heavy officer casualties and disorganization. Nevertheless, it appeared that the men were still seemed capable of achieving some of their goals. That morning, the men were to attack in the general direction of the village of Exermal. Any advance was destined to be fraught with difficulty. In effect, the 35th Division was, quote, a number of small units waging little individual wars against a well-organized and well-directed enemy who pummeled them with artillery and machine gun fire. Despite the difficulties, a small portion of the 35th managed to gain a foothold in Exermont, but it was quite obvious that the beleaguered men there could not hold their position without reinforcements. General Traub finally decided that his division had reached its high water mark. At 11 a.m., he sent a message to his superiors, quote, regret to report that this division cannot advance. It is thoroughly disorganized through loss of officers and many casualties. Recommend it be withdrawn. Under the cover of an artillery barrage, his men were ordered to begin withdrawing from Exermont to Montrebeau Wood beginning at 1 p.m., then to abandon the wood to the enemy and retire to a line in front of a high ridge northeast of Boney where defensive positions had been prepared by some engineers. Trance and his men were ordered to join the engineers on the ridge. Entire units, small groups, and even single doughboys found their way to the ridge. The evening of September 29, 1918 found the exhausted 35th Division, quote, still able and willing to hold its shallow foxholes on the heights, but unable to take the offensive, but still capable of halting any German advance. Gaunt and unshaven men rubbed weary eyes with grimy hands, glanced at the gray and rain-sodden dawn, and looked bleakly at the still grayer faces of men who yesterday had been like them, but now had found peace and rest, Trance remembered. Four days of heavy casualties, fierce enemy opposition, and terrible weather conditions had wrecked the 35th Division. On Boney Ridge, Trance and his men spent September 30th manning the defensive line where one more member of his company was destined to lose his life. Early on the morning of September 30th, as the front line was being heavily shelled, Sergeant Edwin Wiggins placed his four machine guns into position and hurried to a concrete pillbox to make his report. Just as he reached the door, the Germans made a direct hit on the building just above the door. Sergeant Wiggins fell into the building dead, a small piece of shell having penetrated his head behind the left ear. Like Sergeant Charles Edwards, the 22-year-old Wiggins was a longtime member of the company. He was also one of the men who everyone believed would have, been, would have made an officer had he lived. Wiggins was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, the Army's second highest award at that time. His citation read, quote, Sergeant Wiggins led a machine gun platoon to a threatened portion of the line under a heavy enemy barrage, encouraged his men, and directing the construction of emplacements. He also organized a group of infantrymen who had become separated from their organizations and put them into the line 
supervising their entrenchments. This gallant soldier was killed just as this, as this work was completed. In the wake of Wiggins' death, Schrantz and his men were still uneasy. The Missouri machine gunners stared expectantly to the north, wearily worked the bolts of their weapons to be sure they were still in firing order, and then waited while rumors and uncertainties circulated. Tense nerves were strung to a high point, and the tale which caused the greatest anxiety was to the effect that a further withdrawal was imminent, Schrantz explained. The engineer commander on the ridge assured Schrantz that I am going to die right here. But at 10 a.m., the exhausted Captain Schrantz sent a desperate message to his superiors, quote, machine guns unassisted by infantry are being left to hold the enemy. Our best men have already been killed. If the sacrifice is necessary, we do not complain, but is it necessary? Only the most immediate action can save the remaining machine guns of the division. The division machine gun officer talked to Schrantz and convinced him that the situation was not as dire as he reported. Finally, on the night of September 30th, units of the first division, the Big Red One, moved forward and began to relieve the spent 35th men. The last of their troops left the line at about 5.45 a.m. on October 1st. In all, five enlisted men of Schrantz's company and one attached ammunition carrier had been killed, while two officers and 32 enlisted men and 13 attached ammunition carriers had been wounded. As the Company A men marched away from the battlefield, the exhausted and bloody survivors had to endure one more test of strength. When Schrantz halted his men and allowed them to fill their canteens, a limousine pulled up and a polished figure got out and introduced himself as Lieutenant Colonel Peck from General Headquarters. Schrantz described what happened next. Quote, he seemed to be in a highly critical mood. Why have you let your men fall out on the left of the road, he inquired. The reply was to point out that quite, the quite obvious fact that on the left, there was a hill on which the men could sit, whereas on the right, they would need to stand in, in water. Why are you letting your men drink water marked not, not marked as having been tested, he queried further. The answer to this was that this water had been said by the French to be good and marked as having been tested and found pure, that they would have been without water for many days since none of the character None of that character had been seen since two days before the battle started. Captain James J. Corey of Company B had come up and stood listening to this exchange. Huge and genial, he had evidently tired of this line of conversation. For Christ's sake, Colonel, he burst in with an expansive grin, give me a cigarette. This broke the ice. The Colonel produced the cigarettes, asked some normal questions about routes, and as the machine gunners moved on, was preparing to sally out in his shining car. Despite their losses and the fact that they had been withdrawn, Trance and his comrades could enjoy at least some satisfaction from the fighting in the Meuse Argonne. They had advanced nearly eight miles into German held territory and had held a line more than six miles forward of the original front line. They had captured at least 751 enlisted men and 13 officers. Two members of the division were recognized for valor with the Medal of Honor and 85 more with the Distinguished Service Cross they had finally achieved the status of combat veterans. But that hard-earned distinction had come at enormous cost. At least 6,000 members of the division were killed, wounded, or captured. The Carthage men eventually returned to a quiet sector of the front line near Verdun and remained there until the early morning of November 6th when the company was relieved. When the guns fell silent on November 11, 1918, Company A was in the village of La Vallée. Our own men took it with some outward indifference that they had learned to take all things, Schrantz recalled. Probably most of them rejoiced inwardly that the war was over. Probably others regretted a little that the opportunity to square old scores with the enemy had passed forever. For myself, I sat long that night staring into the fire and thinking of the dead, and by us at least, still inadequately revenged. Be that as it may, the war was a thing of the past, and the thoughts of returning to our faraway homes soon overcame any momentary feelings of depression. On March 8, 1919, Captain Ward Schrantz had this order posted in the billets and on the company bullet board, bulletin board at Vadonville, France. In the Meuse-Argonne battle, you handled the most difficult part of one of the best and most important machine gun barrages ever put down by an American division. During the trying days and nights of battle that followed, 
you conducted yourselves with the greatest possible bravery and devotion to duty. Unshaken by losses, without rest or sleep, and often without food, the company, through the courage and ability of every man in it, functioned perfectly throughout the battle. The members of no organization can behave themselves with greater gallantry in action. You have taken a worthy part in the winning of the greatest of all wars. You can go back to civilian life well content. Ward L. Trance. Fifteen days later, Ward Trance was promoted to major and left his beloved company to take command of a battalion in the 35th Division. On April 13, 1919, Company A climbed the gangplank of the American Transport Matsonia in San Nazaire and landed at Newport News, Virginia on April 24th. On the morning of May 4th, they reached Camp Funston, Kansas, and three days later, each man received his discharge and boarded a train homeward bound. The citizens of Carthage were overjoyed that not only had their company returned largely intact, but also that their fellow Missourians had upheld the, the honor of the community. Company A covered itself with glory, wrote the Carthage, Missouri Evening Press. Alan McReynolds, a former captain of the Light Guard, wrote that for over 40 years, the community life of Carthage has been enriched by the Light Guard. The boys who went from Carthage to France fought their way through the tangled depths of the Argonne Forest and today bring home the richest heritage yet laid upon its altar. Their duty done, they modestly bring home a record of manly courage, untarnished and unstained. Company A, Carthage's own, returned with a record of glorious achievement that will live as long as memory, echoed the Carthage, Missouri Evening Press. Carthage realizes that she owes you much more than she can ever repay. And may the old hometown never forget for one moment that binding obligation. The veterans of Company A resumed their former lives as best they could. After the cheering died away, the citizen soldiers again took their places back in the old hometowns. Partly misunderstood, partly victims of envy, partly incapacitated for life by the gallant service they gave to state and nation, wrote the Kansas City Star on the 10th anniversary of the war. Many of the younger ones went back to school, others returned to the farm, still others hunted for their first job, a small number regained the vocations they had left in 1917. The 128th Machine Gun Battalion held frequent reunions where the old doughboys could be found fighting the war over again. But as their numbers dwindled and the men of Carthage went on to serve in a far more costly war in 1941, the memory of Company A and the sacrifices they endured in the Meuse Argonne gradually disappeared. Now, with the passing of the centennial of America's involvement in the Great War, it is time to remember what correspondent Claire Kennemore wrote in 1919. Quote, they were mighty men of war, these long boys from the Ozarks, and they will not soon be forgot. Thank you very much for listening.